the fall of 2020, Christian pastor Carl Lentz was fired as leader of the New York branch of the international megachurch, Hillsong. The latest in the Carl Lentz saga. Oh, it's bad. Bad. Disgraced pastor. In a statement, Lentz admitted he had been unfaithful in his marriage. He was interviewed by his wife. I was by myself at Christmas with the three kids. About his extramarital affair. Did he tell you he loved you? Yes, he did. I am Pastor AJ. This is Gospel Ministries. You can also learn more about me at PastorAJ.com. You can subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. It's just an encouraging way for me to stay connected to you. So before you do that, I want to encourage you to like this video, subscribe to the channel. Again, I would greatly appreciate it if you would do that and share this video with a friend. I, I went before, so two days after all of our stuff exploded. And so but you I thought, came back so excited. I did because on site was where I... So what he's talking about here is how he went off to therapy after this all went down. There's hope for me. Yeah. I don't know how I'm going to get it done, but the choices I've made, not my responsibility. And I'll get into that in a second, but that was huge for me because at that point I was just so filled with my own self-loathing. I had written myself off right. and I left on site going, I don't know, there might be hope for me yet. So we're in LA and at that same time, I could feel myself spiraling. And when, when, you talk, when I talk about a spiral, you find out you're caught up in compulsive living you, or you feel like you can't control your compulsions and desires and it just, it becomes a pattern cycle. And I basically told you, we were sitting on the beach and I said to you, I'm, I'm not gonna make it. I feel like I'm gonna do exactly what I've done. And that's pretty much always been my cycle. The, mm -hmm. A cycle uh, that would include things that I hate and, and then the regret and then the remorse and the loathing and, and do it again. So the cycle sometimes can be, it can be months in between some of that stuff happening. And I just mm -hmm. said, I'm, I'm right on the doorstep. Like I know, and I feel like I can't control myself. Mm -hmm. I want to go somewhere to get real help. And you said to me, yes, I agree with you. you know, if you do this again, there is no second chance. There's nothing. It's, we're done. And I might even leave now. But I want you to know, I hope it goes well. And I think it's going to be something that helps you. And I'm believing for the best. And that was a crazy day. So uh, I don't know if you know anything about the background of all of this. Just kind of crazy actually seeing his wife uh, sitting here with him. I mean, you know, I, it, it's really hard to put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's been through an extramarital affair. And, uh, you know, how would you respond? But just interested to hear what your thoughts are. If you want to leave a comment, I'd like to see how you feel about his overall demeanor. Do you feel like, hey, here's a pastor who's really good at connecting with people? Or do you feel like when he's talking, hey, this is a slick salesman who's just really good at kind of getting people to hear what he wants them to hear? What's your thoughts on that? And I went there knowing that I had issues and I found out when I was there that I was dealing with multiple addictions. Well, you found out first at onsite, yeah. I think, that you had... An anxiety disorder. Disorder. And uh, chronic depression. Yeah. And that all happened at onsite. Right. So I came home from onsite knowing that I'm chronically depressed, unmedicated, have an anxiety disorder, and I didn't think I had any anxiety. Turns right. out that I internalized it so deeply that it just became a part of who I was. Mm -hmm. And I found out I had some childhood trauma. I don't know about you, but a lot of times when somebody's caught in an egregious offense and they start talking about how they're struggling or they deal with struggles or they they have some kind of sickness, my natural tendency is to feel like, oh wow, that's a you know that's a convenient excuse. He, he does go into, like I said, his past, some things that he dealt with in childhood. You know, my my sincere hope for Carl Lentz is is that he can recover, that he has recovered, that we're you know getting a, a, a truthful portrayal of him and his motives and, you know, his desire to change and not see himself relapse into something like this again. Mm. And then so when I got to this rehab, it was, I mean, the drive from the airport to the thing is about an hour and a half into the dead of night desert. And they search you and you go through a big medical examination and they basically shut the door behind you. And I remember that day going, this is it for Real. me. Like, well, I, I can't was, believe them. And I couldn't yeah. talk to you for two weeks. Two weeks. The first two weeks. So, and this was over Christmas time. Yeah, and our so kids my are first still Christmas. wondering wow. what's going on. And then I leave to go to a rehab. You're by yourself. I was by myself at Christmas with the three kids. With the kids. On the other side of the country that we just moved yep. to. And right before that was Thanksgiving, where we were headed to a friend's house that called 
five minutes before we left and said, hey, we don't want you to come anymore. So our kids were like, well, why aren't we going to Thanksgiving at this person's house? And I'm like, you know what? We just, our plans have changed. And everybody was kind of reeling from that. And it's still, that's still painful because that's more kid stuff that isn't deserved. Like I, I get well, it. The, I mean, Ava's talked about that. She yeah. said that she, during that time, she didn't know if you were coming back. This is one of the most amazing things to me is watching his wife sit here and talk to him. I mean, thinking about the, them even still being together, what would your reaction be if you found yourself, in particular your spouse, in the midst of a scandal like this? And uh, what would you do? Would you kick them out of the house? Would you try to reconcile? Uh, I honestly, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure how I would handle something like that. But, uh, you know, obviously there's nothing wrong with, you know, an initial, probably expected initial outburst of, of anger. But uh, I think seeing that, the, that she stayed with him through all of this. I mean, and, and if I understand him correctly, too, he mentions how he relapsed again. Holy cow. Right. Cause, yeah. And because she was how old? 15? 15. 16. Yeah. And so the anxiety, she started to have some anxiety Stomach issues. Stomach issues. Stomach mm-hmm. issues started from that, which yeah. we didn't realize until a couple of years ago yeah. when she started talking about it. She's like, I think that's when I started to get anxious was I didn't know if dad when, was coming back yeah. from when he went away in LA because mm-hmm. everything was so up and like just yeah. crazy. Fast they just, because Charlie that's had awful. come from hospital we stay. We don't live in New York anymore. Well, yeah, we, after she was yeah. done with the hospital, we left from New York yeah. the next day yep. and moved to L.A. So everyone was just reeling. It was awful. So I, I'm in I'm in that, that rehab. And, you know, that that place to me is it's it's the use of mental picture called hugging the cactus. That's what real recovery what looks like. like. Yeah. And you can leave anytime you want. And I definitely tried to leave twice, th- maybe three times even. Well, I said if you've. Yep. I told someone to tell you. If you leave early. If you leave early, don't yeah. come back here. Yeah. And, and there you go. No talking for two weeks, and then you start getting letters. And, you know, I, I read some of them a couple months ago. We were looking through it. And I, I don't, like, even looking back on the letters, so you sit there, and I think the feeling of being an utter failure overwhelms you when you're at a rehab. Imagine. And you're just there, like, what has my life become? And I got, I remember reading Ava's beautiful handwriting when she basically said, dad, I love you. Yeah. She said, dad, I love you. And rehab is going to be great because they're going to help you fix some of the broken pieces. Now, this is obviously the portion of the video where he uh, seems to be showing some deep emotional connection. And uh, I was honestly, when the video started and I saw him talking, I thought, you know, slick preacher. Then we got to this part. He started crying and he continued crying the way that he talked about his kids, regardless of how you feel about him. Tell me this doesn't move you to tears thinking about how something like this affects the children who are right in the middle of it. Those of you who have been through a divorce and, you know, unfortunately, God forbid, if you ever go through one, you see these kind of things affect your kids firsthand and it's just gut wrenching. I mean, I, I hate even in a situation like this where y- you have somebody who had this secret life that, that was going on for a long, long time. And, and then a woman who stays with him, incredible on, on its own. Even in a situation like that, I, I think you have to connect with uh, some of these people on an emotional level and think about just how it affects the lives that are involved and connected. And even at one point there mentions about the daughter that she was actually dealing with anxiety problems because of this for for some time before they found out about it. How does that feel as a dad? Oh, it's bad. Bad. Because I'm like, I don't need my baby girl encouraging me. This is not the design. It definitely set me up, though, to, to stick it out. And I found out that I was molested you know, as a, as a young boy. And when that happens, your brain chemistry is altered. And once they broke it down for me, I realized this is a significant part of who I am that I have left unaddressed, unattended. And that you downplayed. That I downplayed my whole life. And I was so mad most of the time at rehab. I was so mad because I'm like, this is such a clear reason. Why can't, why couldn't God save me a different way? You know, and that I spent every other day mad because I'm like, this isn't this isn't fair. You know, I've got and they and they teach you and it's good for me to re-highlight on our own podcast. When you give reasons for why you failed, it is not an excuse. If we don't give people reasons, nobody can grow from our story. 
There is no excuse for what I did. Right. None. And there's still reasons. So the reasons are what they are. They don't change my consequence. They don't change the fact that it's my responsibility. But when I found out that sexual abuse to a child in that way can alter you and, and, and begin a life pattern of secrecy and hiding and secrecy and hiding. And you don't, even know, why. You don't even know why I'm doing this. I don't know. And slowly but surely, it was, I remember going in there feeling like a block of ice. And I felt like every day I would melt a little bit. Well, the first, I was going to say the first. Interesting hearing him here talk about childhood and, and past with abuse, because I think here, really, this, this is where I would imagine it, it could rub some people the wrong way, because he seems to be maybe justifying his behavior a little bit or maybe at the very least explaining it. I don't know that he's necessarily excusing it, but you know, he does multiple times say in this interview, I, I was the one who did it. He does take responsibility for it. So I mean I think if it weren't for that, you would be tempted probably in this moment really to question is he what is he doing here? Is this actually a legitimate of uh, 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 apology or or what's going on here? But uh, you know, w- one thing I really wish for him when I look at him in what he's wearing there and and all of that like, I, I understand the desire to connect with people as a pastor. I'm not one who wears a suit to preach on Sunday morning, but I'm not saying a person has to, like, you know, dress ugly either. But with the nature of what he struggles with, I, I, I just can't help but wonder, like, you know, why not, uh, why not dial, back the, dial it back a notch, you know, like the fashionability and, and that kind of a thing. I, I just, I can't help but wonder, like, is that your propensity to really try to look good all the time and speak good and, and, you know, be slick and personable with your words? I can't help but wonder, would that, you know, maybe propel him into other compromising positions where he struggled? letter I got from you that I burst into tears was when you said I've realized I've got a drug addiction yeah and I feel so different and I bawled my eyes out because one of my things that that. I've been praying for for years was the fact that I knew yeah I could see it it was not good like it was not doing you good and anytime I'd try to bring it up it was like I mean it's like when you talk to an addict it's they're going to give you the pushback yeah so it just was always an awful conversation. So when you did that, when you sent me that letter, I bawled my eyes out and I felt such a relief. Mm. And so then I, it just gave me hope yeah. for whatever else was coming mm. <laughs> for the next yeah. six weeks of you being there. Man, that would be hard. You know, e- even under the circumstances, I, I would imagine, I mean, I, I would probably be pretty angry. And, you know, let's say you throw your spouse out of the house, but that would still be hard. I mean, it, it's hard to, it, there's kids in the picture. You know, it's hard to blame somebody. You almost want to look at a woman like this and be like, why on earth are you still with this guy? But, uh, you know, I mean, uh, these kind of situations are obviously incredibly difficult. Like I said, if you've been through something like this before, then uh, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, so yeah, that was amazing. What you learn in rehab is, is tools to stop manipulating everything around you. And I had learned ways to manipulate situations and people. You think? so I could function how I needed to function. And when you go to a place like that, there's just nowhere to go. There's nowhere to hide. And there were some really tough, tough, hard moments. But sticking that out is one of the my proudest victories as a man. Can because, you talk about, sorry, keep going. No, go ahead. Can you t- You know, imagine the amount of manipulation. My understanding too, if I remember correctly, back to when this was all going down and, and some of the stuff that they were saying in the news about it, like, the church knew about it. They, I don't know that they covered it up, but they, well, I guess they covered it up. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe somebody can correct me in the comments, but but they knew about it. This was something that happened multiple times before he was eventually caught with the woman that he was caught with. You know, obviously has a propensity for this kind of thing. It's, boy, what is that like? You know, being in the mind of somebody who has this level of a secret life. You know, I've always wondered that because I've, I've thought to myself, like, I have a hard time not being honest. And sometimes I'm painfully honest. I don't know if there's anybody else out there like me, but I've, I've just wondered, uh, you know, what would it what would it be like to to uh, live in this kind of secrecy and the control and, and the manipulation? I would suspect there was a lot of, you know, this is a you problem. I mean, probably saying those kinds of things to his wife, maybe you've had this done to you, maybe you've done it. You know, statistics show that there's somebody listening to this right now that's watching this. You've been the abuser. 
you've been the adulterer. You've been the one in the in the secret life, and uh, you know what 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 all went into that, and uh, how did how how did you walk around in secrecy? The Talk way about that you did? one of the most significant moments that helped you in rehab. Which one? I was thinking about the you talking to your little self. Oh man! Because I think people think rehab is just maybe sitting in a room and like recover, like trying to <laughs> recover from whatever addiction you have. What was the work like? Like, yeah. I just remember you talking about this one yeah. part that was very... Yeah. Yeah, let me get there. I'm just going to take a, a breath. I think my tears still work. I understand. They're real. Someone was asking... Boy, he just seems so polished when he's talking. It's it's just really hard to, uh, hard to get my there. Did, my dad always used to cry when he preached. And were those tears real? And I'm proud to say, I understand the criticism even, but crying was a healthy part of my life before. One of the few. One of the, one of the And it has few. carried over might even be worse. So my my tears are might come out. I wish I could do it on command. Not that good. Not that special. You go through a thing where they, they help you dig into the age you were when that abuse happened. And it's hard. You know, it's, it's, you just don't want to go there. And when you first get to rehab, there's a bunch of grown men walking around with stuffed animals. And you're like, man, what is, what are these guys doing with stuffed animals? They're like, oh, have you been to week three yet? I'm like, no, you'll see. It's like, it's like fight club. And then we go through our own. And I remember as I'm sitting there with the therapist, and you do it with three other guys that are in your learning pod. Is anybody else out there wondering, like, is this true? I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but I mean, uh, you know, obviously a terrible thing, by the way. I mean, I mean, many, many people deal with that. And, uh, you know, I, I've had grown men talk to me about their situation from childhood, just like he talks about here. There's always hope, no matter what you're going through. Odd. After we start talking for a little bit, I remember grabbing my otter. <laughs> like a stuffed otter. And I remember like leaving that thing after a lot of stuff went down in that session and walking around with my stuffed animal. And I would see new guys. They'd be like, what's with the stuffed animal? I'd be like, you'll, you'll see. But they force you to go back to that age where you were damaged and begin to speak life into it and begin to understand yourself and begin to understand what happens to a brain at that age. And I had a beautiful family, a beautiful upbringing. Love my mom and dad. They're amazing. It just was one horrible situation with a house guest as a parent it's your worst nightmare because we've all been there you trust people and and i was violated i was abused and caused a lot of wreckage and i'm i'm gonna use it and, and it's i don't know if i'll ever not be emotional I, it's, it's hard to think about what it was like to be lost before knowing some of these answers and so you get to this place where you start talking to this kid they make you write a letter with your left hand which looks really like the age everybody was and interesting and, and it just began a journey for me of being kind to myself and uh, being patient with myself. Because what you didn't realize was you were you hated yourself. You, yeah. I mean, worse than that, you loathed. Yeah, yeah. There are there are parts of this is one of the things that uh, they say about abusers is that they'll put pressure on people, young people, and and it's often too. It's it's other young people. In fact, correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I, I believe most of the time molestation occurs. It, it isn't. It, it's another young person. <laughs> it's it's a 17 year old. It's a you know 12 year old when the kid's five or something like that who themselves have been molested. And so, uh, but but the reason that a lot of people don't come out sooner. Sometimes there's threats. Sometimes there's the, you know, I'll, I'll tell your parents, you know, you're, you'll are you get in trouble or something like that. But it's it's really, it's a personal shame. And people blame themselves, unfortunately, for these kinds of things. Me, you know, with, with loathing that I didn't understand, because I dealt with the up and down of a compulsive issue, addiction, my whole life. And you just start to hate yourself. You start to hate that part of you. And then you've you got to bring that part out. And you have to talk to it, speak to it. Look at it. Give it help. Repressing it doesn't work. Right. Hate. You know, how many of us out there, you know, maybe not with a, with abuse, maybe you have dealt with that specific issue, but I, I think everybody can relate with that, uh, that idea of hating yourself. That's something that really, how many times do we do things? How much of what we do is because of something that happened in our childhood? It's because of, you know, something somebody said to us. And uh, when we can break free from that and realize realize that, that God loves us and he's got a plan for us. We're on the right course. It doesn't work. Using bad Christian doctrine about praying more praying in a does way. not work. Right. And that's where I found out I, I will not be a victim to the situation. And they start to give you language for that. And now I don't look at my abuse as something that destroyed my life. I look at it as something that has helped me be a catalyst mm. for healing in my own life and hopefully for other people. 
So I- that's a good place to just pause for a second and ask, is there something you're dealing with right now? I, I'm sure that uh, there's somebody in your life you can talk to, you can reach out to for help. You know, being a pastor, I always want to tell people, go to church. If you're not a church person, church is a great place to go just to get started. A lot of times you need to talk to a counselor, you need to take some more steps. But, you know, for me as a young person, church was uh, church was freedom. Church was a great place where I could go to get to know God and find the healing I needed. I think the same is true for you, friend. I, I sit here today with years of sobriety as yes. a, you know, a recovering addict, and I'm proud of that. It's awesome. But more than that, I sit here with a whole lot of compassion. And because I know so many people have been through similar things and they haven't had the opportunity to go where I went. Right. And yes, my failures were in public and that is bad. It's way, it's very hard, but I don't know if it's worse to fail in private where nobody knows and you just have to deal with it yourself. I would I would say it's uh, nobody wants the kind of situation he was involved in. You know, it's uh, if if God can spare you from that, then, you know, that's uh, I always find, too, there's warnings. You know, there's like red flags all along the way where I don't know if you were ever a kid. And, you know, uh, my whole story is I I read the Bible for the first time in a jail cell when I was 16. Me and my friends were playing a prank on our principal. We ended up in jail. And that was the first time I read the Bible. I made God a promise. I'd read the Bible when I got out. And that was kind of, that's what started me on the path of coming to know Christ and, uh, you know, changed me. But I remember before I got arrested and spent that night in jail, I remember, you know, there was, there were several points along the way where I could have stopped, you know? So if, if that's you, I'm going to answer this question that he just threw out there. I don't know if it's better. It, it is better. It's better to stop short of a huge catastrophe that defines you publicly in the eyes of other people. The Lord wants to save you from that. And things like this should be a big warning to anyone that is walking in some kind of a secret sin. You will be found out. It's just a matter of time. So, you know, if if you want to spare yourself what he dealt with, take the steps that he took after the catastrophe happened, you know, except before before the stuff hits I the I look fan. at it now, even that is a blessing right. because if you watched my life blow up, in public, please keep watching. Yeah. You know, you owe it to yourself to see where the story goes. I'm an example of somebody that made huge mistakes. And rather than just try to not get caught again, I wanted to change. Man, I hope he doesn't. No, I just, I look at these people and I think to myself, like, you know, let's, let's say he, this is legit. This guy obviously struggles with an addiction and it ain't just a prescription pills. Like he, he struggles massively with sexual addiction. There's cycles that are, that are involved in his life that my guess is he's going to struggle with it for the rest of his life. My father was an alcoholic who stopped drinking before I was born, you know, made a huge impact on my life. And I know that my dad couldn't take a drink of alcohol like ever. He had 37 years of sobriety before he died, 37. And I know that, you know, after, you know, in his 37th year, it wasn't like, okay, I'm healed now. I can go, I can go drink alcohol. I'm good. It wasn't like that. And so, I mean, I would think that he's putting on a good show here and I'm, I'm hoping that, that this is legit change, but I, I sure hope not just for him, but for his, his wife who has stuck with him through all of this stuff. How many women would have done that for the sake of Carl Lentz? He's a human being. You know, my prayer is that, you know, he, he really is recovered from this and that it's going to last. Is a, there's a part of you that's like, how quickly can I repair this so I can, you know, move on? And you see it all the time in ministry, like dudes will go through stuff and then a, a month later they're doing they're it again, the... whether it's starting a new church. Mm-hmm. And I cannot judge those people. I don't. All I know for me is it took me decades decades to get where I was. And it wasn't going to fix itself in a couple of months. You really, really got to excavate. You got to break it all down. Sometimes you have to completely allow life, God, to break it down for something better to be built. And that's, that's my story for sure. I lost, I lost a lot in that fire. I lost. Do do you think maybe this is one of the problems with an addict and, and everybody's a sin addict, right? I mean, so we can all relate with this, Uh, you know, not judging based on the kind of sin, but do, do you think maybe the problem is the addict thinks uh, often very quickly, I'm over this. See, I, one, of the, uh, one of the signs that uh, we're right on the verge of a fall, maybe an epic fail of some kind. So, uh, you know, I, I think about the, the Bible verse, watch yourself lest you are tempted. We've got to be very, very it's careful. A lot. But what came out of it was a different human being. And I'm here today, you know, very, very, very involved in our recovery community. I did have a relapse, 
and and that was a couple of months after I got back from rehab and I you know pride is a thing that dies what was that like I mean he, he mentions it very casually here to his wife and to everybody listening this is one of those moments I'm I'm really flabbergasted that she's still with him <laughs> your spouse comes back from rehab and they fall right back into it again. Holy cow, what do you what do you do? But I remember talking to the nurses before I left, they give you an outpatient plan and they're like, you know, a lot of guys struggle, you know, and there 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 is, you know, relapse potential and I'm like, I am not going to relapse. Which I think every single Yeah, I'm like <laughs> they teach you how to live a life where you you draw circles. There's an outer circle, which is super healthy behavior. There's a middle circle, which is danger ground. It's stuff you can't avoid as an addict, as a recovering addict, but it's stuff that you really need to be mindful of. And then there's an inner circle, which is a complete Never relapse. Got to go back. Yeah. And when I had my relapse, only a couple months, maybe three, four months after getting back, I remember looking at you and explaining the situation as, it, as if it was already over. Like, hey, I, I, this is what happened. And I'm sorry. I understand. If you will, if you go. I understand I've got no more chances here. I don't see this like that. I didn't know that this particular thing was going to trip me up like that. And I know that I can fix it. Here's what I'm going to do to fix it if you'll allow me. And, and you were really gracious with me. I don't know where you dug to find that kind of grace. But it's a real part of my our story. And I, I mean, what what was she thinking in that moment? And, and if, you know, if you have been in that situation before, you're a woman, your husband's had multiple affairs maybe on you and you stayed. What is the mindset? You know, you you wonder, I, I'm, I'm wondering what's in her mind even as he's talking, but, but is this really the only slip up? But you know, that's uh, my goodness gracious, my goodness gracious. It's, it, wow. And it's important that people know that because I know a lot of people try to get sober and they fail. It's a terrible feeling. And I'm not sitting up here, you know, as a guy who I, I've been there, I'm there today. I've, I've got to stay sober today. I've right. got to stay recovered today, and I've got to do it again tomorrow. But I like being able to look at guys and say, man, I, I'm sure you've been humiliated. I have been too. I'm sure your situation was bad. Mine was real bad. Yeah. And I'm sure you feel discouraged because you you might have relapsed. I've, I've been there, but there's hope. Right. And so that's what the, the rehab part of this story for me was, was powerful. I don't know. I, I've already been able to help a couple other people get there. That's a joy. It's beautiful. And between the two of us doing the work that we've done, you know, we're sitting here very different people, yep. but really grateful for it. I would think this is what I wanted to ask. Does the person who is staying in this situation, the wife or hypothetically the husband, do they just sort of mentally and emotionally not forgive and naively go, okay, this person really has changed, but like, what made you stay? Did you just accept that, that you might always wonder and, and, and maybe even in the back of your mind, think this person is going to cheat on me again, but I'm going to stay with them anyways. Not necessarily something, I mean, I, I can never tell anybody what to do. I don't know that that's really the best way to go about it or advice, pastorally advice I would give to somebody in that situation. I think a lot of times what you find in the person who's been cheated on is a a fear of moving on themselves. They don't know who, who they are without their marriage. They don't know who they are without their spouse who cheats on them all the time. There's a little bit of this in all of us. And, and, and even outside of the, the marital relationship, there's a lot of us, we just, we, we get attached to things and people, you know, but I think God's always trying to grow us. I, I know there's a healthy way to do that, you know, and I'm glad that they're still together. But, you know, I, I kind of hope that in the back of her mind, she's not just like, you know, well, here's this, this guy and he's always going to cheat on me. And I'm okay with that. You know, we, I don't think we ever, I don't think Jesus would tell us to constantly put ourselves in a position. You know, he, he did mention, specific, Jesus mentioned specifically, that that was the exception, was marital unfaithfulness for divorce. You know, so that, that's obviously a very serious thing. And, uh, you know, the, the, the motivation there. So hopefully she can move on from that. And uh, I forget what else I was going to say. You are a very different person. And I think... That's been hard for me. It's been sad because the people that have left our life, I feel like, oh, if mm. if they, you know, you were a great friend, a great person before this, but you're an even better person now. Like you're such a different person. And I think I, I saw someone put up the other day on Instagram something along the lines of that. Like people remember where you were, but it's a shame that they don't stick around to see what what you become. Yeah. And I mean, I think that we've got a lot yeah. of friends that have stuck around and have been, it's been amazing, but I just want to say publicly, I'm proud of who you are. Thank you. And love. the man 
that you've become and the work that you put in every day to be that mm. person. I know it's not easy. I know any addiction isn't easy to uh, overcome oh. and but you do it really well day by day and you're very conscious of it and I see it yeah. and I acknowledge it. it was also so, so she I mean, answers my question, I guess, clearly has some kind of a, a belief that he is changed or I guess at least changing and, uh, you know, a, a good support, I guess, a good spouse. But, uh, you know, not necessarily, like I said, as a pastor, uh, it, it's really hard to tell people what to do in these kinds of situations because she did have a biblical warrant to step out of this marriage. Although I don't think that should always be our, our first response, depending on the situation. You know, you, you see in, in the Bible, God tells the prophet Hosea to go and take an adulterous wife, which he does, and she cheats on him, and he tells him to take her back, and this happens multiple times. It's an illustration for God's relationship with Israel, and by default, us, because we're grafted in as Christians. I don't know if you knew that or not. Grafted into, into Israel, you are a part of God's chosen people, and so it's a metaphor of God's relationship with us. He doesn't leave us. We shouldn't always be quick to look at offense and give it what it deserves. You know, I'm thinking of the woman caught in adultery where Jesus tells, you know, them, let he among you who is without sin cast the first stone. You all know the story. But uh, yeah, but uh, I guess that's what she did. Like I said, I mean, I, I don't, it's, it's hard to know what's in a person's heart. You know, I just, I, I hope she doesn't have that kind of a, a mentality where she just is unable, incapable of, of stepping out of us. A lot of times by staying in a situation like that, you become what a lot of people call an enabler. You, you actually help that person to perpetuate their cycle. Whereas if you're willing to step out of with the threat of removing yourself from the relationship, it's actually the best thing for the person who's caught in the sin cycle. Heavily, thank you. I was heavily addicted to my own opinion. Right. Which is a very sinister, but just as deadly, you know, addiction. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for where we sit. You know, some people that left, we'll talk about friendships in depth, but I think it's hard when you go through a valley and people leave and you get out of the valley and they might come back and you're so different that it's like, God, I don't we know don't. If we, yeah, got nothing to. We, we, yeah, we're not the same people. So it's like I, you, you had to leave for your reasons. But when you're not with somebody in the fire, you can't understand what the fire smells like, what it right. feels like, because you chose to leave. The reasons don't need to get judged. You just weren't there. Yeah. And so you. Which there's a better way to come out of. You don't want to look at things like this. This is what I, I always want to tell young people who are raised in the church. You don't want to listen to the drug addicts testimony and then psychologically think that you're supposed to go through this incredibly, you know, horrible situation to find Jesus. Jesus meets us in those horrible situations. He met me in a jail cell, but I wouldn't like recommend that. I think the better thing is, especially from a, a church perspective, we want to make sure that we're not glorifying by any stretch what they did. I, I think this goes on far too often in, in a church context. And, you know, a lot of times I think people, kids, kids pick this up in Christian schools, just in Christian circles and churches. This idea that I'm, I'm this drug addict story. I'm supposed to have this, I hit rock bottom story. There's a lot of people in life that don't hit rock bottom. You, you, you definitely need to realize at some point your inadequacy without Christ, but I, I don't think you have to find yourself losing your wife and kids in order to, in order to do that. So, uh, you know, just something to keep in mind. Like when you hear a person talking about how, you know, I'm, I'm glad about what I went through. Oftentimes I'm thinking like, I hope people watching this aren't glad they went through what they went through. You know, that, that, that's really the whole point is so you tell another person so that they don't go through it. God does afford us other ways to deal with sin in our lives. That, that's being transparent is one of those ways. Being transparent. If you live a lifestyle of transparency, you walk in the light, then, you know, God will deal with, it will help you deal with some of the stuff so that you don't find yourself in this kind of a situation. That, that part of someone's mm. life. And that's, that's not on them. That's on me. That's on the person that made the mistake. Because, yeah. you, you know, you, you don't have to go through valleys with people. You don't. And so, yeah, that is something we found, though, is that when we do catch up with some people, in our heart, we're like, don't don't feel sorry for us. Yeah, we're good. I know you say you're praying for me, but I'm yeah. kind of praying, praying for, for you. you. As you're well. still in it. So that's that's been new to be like, yeah. Hey, yeah, I know, like you might leave and feel sorry for for me. Don't. We're like, don't. The feeling of freedom that you have when you are honest and yeah. living yeah. with no secrets. No, what is it? No secrets, no lies. No secrets, no lies. No 
untalked about triggers. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, super powerful. freeing and very powerful. So it's yeah. sometimes when I see people, I'm like, oh, you still have to live like that. Mm. It's hard. Been there. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a good place to stop. And, you know, feel free to share your thoughts on this. I just felt like it was noteworthy. It, being in the evangelical church community, this was something that, that really, I guess, rocked a lot of people. I, I know that there were those who weren't shocked by it, but it's still one of those public scandals that takes place that I think not just for myself, but for all Christians, when you see stuff like this, you have to really wonder how to compartmentalize the feelings that you have. How do I view this? How do I learn from it? One of the best things you can do as a Christian is learn from the things that other people go through. You're going to have to go through your own things, but I, I think it's, it, it's, it's the exceptional person who can look at somebody else and go, I, I saw what happened to them when they did this, and so I'm, I'm not going to do that. If your parents, teach your kids that kind of stuff. You know, Teach them to uh, learn from other people. I think that's another thing you can do is be honest with your kids uh, to whatever degree you feel like you need to be about your mistakes, about the fact that you're a flawed person. Let them see that in you so that they realize they don't have to be perfect perfect people too. So how does this make you feel? How might you feel like seeing something like this is life changing? And it goes without saying, what are your thoughts on all of it? Do you feel like it's just crocodile tears? Do you feel any need at all to extend any form of sympathy to this infamous individual? I would say at the very least, and, and I know he said at the end there, this is exactly what I was talking about saying, you know, I'm, I'm not sorry that I went through it or I'm, you know, don't feel bad for me, that kind of thing. I would say at the very least, this, this significantly damaged his credibility and the audience that he had. People who would be willing to listen to him because, you know, apart from his wife, he's got a whole lot of people out there who know of him, who listen to his ministry, who listen to him preach sermons. And all of those people now never know whether they're getting the genuine person. That's something that will honestly haunt him for the rest of his life. I love you, friends. God bless you. Keep preaching the gospel. Keep believing in the name of Jesus. And I will see you in the next video.